I'll bring us back down to earth. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I have uh, some mistakes to talk about uh, because uh, the, as a creative professional, you can't be afraid of, of making them. And to have an auspicious start this morning, I thought I'd start with five of them. That's the theme we have, and so we probably have more, but we'll stop with that. Uh, but there's, let's be clear, there's three kinds of mistakes that you can make. There's the kind you make where you're, you, you've made, you, you, you want to correct that and you move on to the next thing. And that's the wrong thing, that's the, to, uh, to find the right thing to do. The next kind of mistake is the kind you, you like to make and you make it over and over again. We call that uh, experimentation and interesting things happen and uh, surprises. And the third kind of mistake is the, the one you make where uh, you, th you think you've made the wrong, uh, the, the, the wrong choice. But a few years later or however much time passes, you, you decide to, uh, to accept it and to deal with it. And that is that uh, we call that, we might call that wisdom. And so the, the first one is misused tools. We, uh, we, we teach uh, digital fabrication at uh, the University of Houston. A lot of what we do is, 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 is teaching uh, students how to uh, take a tool and to find a way to use it more creatively. Uh, the example I can, put, I can pull for this is uh, taken from the art guys, actually. I think we. We know them uh, as uh, some colleagues of ours who uh, we've worked with. And they, painting with a hammer is the example they give. Sort of an absurdity where a tool that is used to drive nails or to pull them out can be, uh, if you use it to paint, you're going to get une unexpected results through that, uh, through that process. And so the past 10 years, we've been teaching digital fabrication as a class whereby we're not only using the tools we have in the school, but also reaching out to companies that have these uh, these machines that we can we can bend them to, to towards creative output. Uh, the next mistake is to move back to Houston. <laughs> uh, my family left in the late 70s, the first time they widened I-10, <laughs> and I came back a few years ago to to see and to do it again. But the cliche that Houston has a problem is is the is sort of the endearing slogan of the city, and it's something we we've kind of learned to live with. But the, what we, when I came back 10 years ago, this is the figures that w and the reality that I faced and the, the opportunities that were built into this. And this is, this is amazing when you think of Houston as having tw twice as many manufacturing jobs uh, in, in, the, in, in the industries of manufacturing and industry, making things. Houston is a leader. So second only to, our, our, uh, New York is second. And uh, 24,000 jobs left Brooklyn in the manufacturing industry in the, uh, in the uh, 10 years ago, it's about the time I moved here. We're rooting for Detroit because it's gonna, it's gonna come back. Uh, and uh, I love this map of Houston where you turn off the local streets, you see the interstate uh, freeways and, and the bayou system. And we're situated uh, here on the green dot. We're close by here. We also have our office near here. And this, this gradient that I laid over it where you see the white, uh, the white collar world of the western part of, the Houst of Houston uh, moving towards the blue collar is a very reductive way of looking at the city, I know, but it's, as, as one who's from here, I think I can do that, but it's this, this sort of this reality of this, this amazing thing that happens when you move east of downtown where we are here and keep going towards the ship channel, that there's an incredible amount of, of things that are made here and produced, but it's all atomized into small job shops and, and, and no unions necessarily are kind of dictating that one thing gets made. And it's the, for oil and gas and for the shipping industries, anything can be made here. So the, our name, uh, Own a Fab Shop, is, is my, the name of my company is Metalab. We specialize in architecture, product design, and civic art product, project management. And the name sort of suggests that we do have a shop. And ask, a lot of people ask, where is our shop? We, we, we do a lot of work with, uh, these are some of the public art projects we've worked on, working with a lot of different materials, steel, wood, uh, cast concrete, precast systems, uh, glass, polymers, and recently a, projects with stone. To have a shop where you could do all these things would be ludicrous. So our shop is everywhere and nowhere. And in this case, this is Campo Sheet Metal, which is five miles from here, has the largest for hire water jet machi machine in the country. And we built this canopy for an art project in, in Austin, 16 feet wide, 48 feet long, 
the largest thing you can put on a truck and ship to Austin where it was installed. And so we, we scale up when we need to and we, we use the machines and the expertise that they have to build at a very large scale. Uh, and we keep track of these different companies on our website through uh, the help of Culture Pilot. We think we know those guys here. Uh, and so we, we're able to update this, uh, this website with uh, the different companies we work with and it's on our, it's on our, our website. And we're very open source with the people we work with because if we refer people to them then uh, it helps us. In the, but we want to spread this culture of making through, throughout the city uh, and to other people. Recently we purchased a building in, uh, in the East End here of Houston and we office, it's a 1920s Art Deco building, we office upstairs, we have a videographers downstairs we lease to them and in the back, well, we do have a shop, <laughs> we couldn't help it, uh, but we lease it out and we have part of the space that we use for a pop-up gallery and then beyond that is an um, engine repair guy, so we, it's a nice cross-section of the different uh, aspects of Houston in, that, in our building. The next mistake, do it yourself, DIY, which is a, maybe a provocative term in a TED talk, but you might know these guys, Smile Booth, uh, the, the developers of a, a very successful product. I would say they're one of the most successful uh, startups here in Houston in the past few years. They came to us, a data, uh, someone who was involved with data mining and uh, an a event photographer, and asked us to help them to develop a, a, a photo booth. Well, if you do an image search online, you see many uh, people have tried this and you get a curtain, you get a camera, and now you can even use your own phone and you can just basically do it yourself. But that doesn't help them develop a product line that is repeatable and expandable and, and modifies according to the need and the, and the desire for different equipment that gets integrated into this. So we, we first uh, had a printer, we removed the printer, and then at some point we removed the camera when, cam when phones became uh, 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 possible to tweet an image to the, to the printer. But they all share a common DNA of an algorithm that we use to develop the skin of the project. That is, a, that is a system that can be easily repeated or, or, or modified. So a mid-level scale of, of, of production is very possible with this. And so uh, the, my, my point is here is to, is to play to your strengths uh, and then hire designers uh, when it's time to, uh, to uh, develop a nice uh, package for your product. And the last mistake is to skip vocational classes. Like in high school, I was already, you know, we were already in the situation where uh, there was a stigma to attach to vocational courses, so you went on to you know, your STEM classes, went to college and all these things, but I always felt like there, I was impoverished by, that, by lacking that experience. So in college, we, we, uh, we built houses, we were carpenters, you welded, and you, to, to, to regain this, this uh, vocational training and add it to where your, where your profession was headed. And so uh, out of that frustration, of, of, uh, of the, the separation between academia, practice, and industry, I founded a, a nonprofit organization called TexFab with some other uh, individuals here in Texas, whereby we could, could, uh, could have sort of mend these, these differences and, the, and the, uh, the, the siloing of these different aspects. The academia, you hit the reset button every semester, you, nothing really gets done. Profession, there's, there's contractual barriers. You can't get involved in how things are, are designed or built necessarily. And industry and manufacturing is in its own world and building what they do and not necessarily communicating with uh, other, other opportunities. So we, we uh, embarked on a, a five-year plan. Uh, it wasn't necessarily, we just happened to be at five years, but we have five different themes or tropes of digital fabrication that we've explored. Uh, repeat, applied, skin, plasticity, and mass uh, are, are these different aspects that we've explored that not only look at different machines, but look at materials and the implications of them. So through the, through the organization, we decided, well, let's not just show our own work. Let's, com let's promote the work of others through this organization and promote the work of fabricators along the way. So we, we commission, we, we fundraise, and we, we build the projects that are, 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 are channeled through the competition. The first one, repeat, is the theme of, 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 this, uh, of, of the, the first project we developed. And the idea of repeat is this idea that uh, algorithms produce difference and variation in a very seamless way relative to information you're putting into them. Materials don't necessarily want to work that way, but we, 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 we wanted to explore this idea that, that the, the competition could, could develop a project out of that notion. 
uh, as, the, as the sole uh, purpose of the, of the design. So with that abstract notion, we put out a call and had a very good success of, of, of entries. A hundred entries came from around the world, from five continents, and we picked one from, from a series of, of, of finalists that was uh, a, a guy from, uh, from, from London who is working in a uh, different media of, of 3D printing and laser cutting, but developing these very interesting surfaces uh, we call them periodic surfaces, where the interior becomes the exterior, but working at a very small scale with tools that were available to him in London and be building in his apartment small, small versions of this uh, project that he called Minimal Complexity. Well, he w once he won the project, we gave him the ability to work with engineers at Bureau Happel to develop this project, to make it real, and to develop a strategy where we could actually build it here in Houston with a fabricator who has no idea how this would work and how, how the, what they were actually doing, and we sort of, uh, they came along with, with uh, financial support. We built more versions of the, of the, uh, of, of the project, and it's actually rep rep repetition of these, uh, of these kite shaped pieces that mirror and, and array around uh, themselves to produce something that is very uh, uh, complex on one hand but minimal in its means. We displayed the project at the College of Architecture. We held an event, invited the designer in and, and discussed the project. The next project was applied, applied research through fabrication. Applied research is something that's very common to academia. We, we sought to, uh, to develop a, uh, the, the applied research whereby the fabrication tools are the means through which one explores the, the, the possibility of, of uh, how to develop a, a system of, of, of structure that could potentially hold up a floor of a building, but is not necessarily uh, the kind of uh, common co columns that you find, but was more of a, a, a cast thicket of, com of columns whereby uh, software would be used to, to shrink wrap the structure according to the forces that were acting upon it. And to cast it out of concrete, we had to develop a system of, of reinforcement structure inside the, the concrete that was very complex on its own, uh, laser cut parts and laser cut pipe. But at the end of the day, we're using uh, a plumb bob to locate these things in space. And then on the exterior for form work, which is typically very rigid, we use a thin uh, plastic material with a sort of zipper connection on the, on the sides that would create these jackets through which you could cast the concrete. So as whereas the previous project was thousands of parts, we ended up with basically two pieces of uh, chunks of concrete at the end. We were seven feet tall and incredibly robust. We exhibited this in Dallas at, our, at our, uh, another event there. The next competition was called Skin. Skin is a, is a uh, kind of a metaphor for how we can think of a building envelope whereby the, 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 uh, the, the facade of a building used to convey its meaning or its use, whereas now we look at the building envelope as a performance uh, uh, opportunity to, to uh, condition the space and to structure the building. Uh, we, we began to get a lot of interest from fabricators who could come on as material support and as fabrication support. This is uh, Zayner's facility. Bill Zayner out of, uh, out of Kansas City was on the jury as well as the as fabrication support uh, to, to help us uh, fund the project beyond the, the kind of crowdsourcing model that we were using through the entries. Uh, so he works in sheet metal, so a lot of the projects were, were, were geared towards that. The one that won the project was in interested in the use of this material called rigidized metal, where you take a sheet of metal, you run it through a press, and you take, so you take the thin metal and make it very uh, much stronger. If you go to a, uh, next time you go to the airport, you look at the bathroom stalls, it's this stuff. So how do you use this material creatively and to and develop a, a, a notion of origami, where you take flat cut parts cut on a laser, and, and through a, a, a press breaking process, you basically create a rigid uh, module that can be uh, stacked on top of each other and, and create a facade system. We exhibited this one in Austin, and uh, it, it, it was uh, at the event at the University of Houston, I mean, the University of Texas. We became interested in, in plasticity and the, the use of polymers in design because of their ubiquitous, a car, a half of a car is, is made out of plastic or more these days. And the, the, the use of this material is in architecture 
uh, is all around us as well. But how do you use that material in a way that is much more uh, non-deterministic and, and, and much more related to how we can think in terms of, of, of 3D modeling and the development of, of actual spaces from this? Uh, we were working with Bill Chrysler, who is the, the fabricator here, and uh, also Craig Dykers, who's a Houstonian, is a, a partner in, uh, in, in uh, Snohetta, and so he was on the jury as well. The projects that came to us were very interesting in how they were developing ideas of how to use polymers, how to use plastics, inflating uh, uh, membranes, and then stacking those materials in interesting ways uh, relative to uh, a, a stereotomic notion of how do you take three-dimensional parts and make them as large as possible so that they can be stacked in a way, much the way you, you, you use bricks, but in a, in a more interlocking uh, position. Uh, this is a project that Bill Chrysler was working on at the same time. It's the, the facade of the SF MoMA. It's the largest uh, facade ever done with, with uh, fiberglass, and the panels themselves were very lightweight. You can lift them up, and so they were, they, these were the panels. And so the, the alternative here would be to use a concrete or something which is very heavy, would, would take a long time to install. So he revolutionized the use of, of fiberglass as an architecture and got it to be uh, uh, f fireproof at the, in the process. So we were working with him to develop this, this uh, three-dimensional structure called plastic stereotomy and uh, started using robotics where we're taking large chunks of EPS foam and, and sculpting them and beginning the fiberglass process. And so these parts were very lightweight at the end. They can, one person or two people could pick them up and, and begin to assemble this pavilion that we shipped here to Houston and exhibited here at the College of Architecture. Uh, and the, there's the designer there, Justin Diles. The last category is mass. We are interested in how, uh, like how we, we, the polymers are, are, are these sort of th three-dimensional shapes. But now we are interested in how stone can actually be fabricated, much like the Inca were making intricate blocks. How do you do that? Well, there's a large robot here actually, in, uh, not in Houston, but in Buda, Texas, that can take any stone and, char and carve it into very sinuous shapes. These are uh, some, some benches we've done. Uh, for an artist uh, here in Houston, and uh, they're up in, in Herman Park on the big mound there. You can go see them, beautiful. Uh, they, so the raw material starts as a solid piece of, of limestone, and it's sculpted into this shape. We have another project in, in, the, in works uh, with an uh, artist from Frankfurt, uh, and we are going to build this project very soon using the same robot. It's going to run for four months straight to carve these, uh, these blocks of the finger plinth. So we haven't done a competition yet, but we have the fabricators uh, lined up, and so it's going to be very interesting. I thank you very much. <laughs>